thanks for coming and joining us today. Uh, specifically, thank you, Nathan, for coming and hanging out with us today and uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge and wisdom. Um, so, uh, no, Nathan, for a little bit now, uh, I almost feel like I think we, we met in a Facebook group, if I remember right. And then something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we, we had lunch, um, uh, became friends. Uh, we were in a, a mastermind together for a little bit when he was here local. And now, now he went and left us out in Colorado. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, Nathan has uh, quite the background, so everything from uh, Amazon uh, to building up free up a huge marketplace of freelancers, um, exited that, uh, built out another company called Outsource School, um, and then I think you even went into like some private equity type venture type things for a little bit. Uh, but but your your thing now which you've been running for almost a year, right? I think you're about to celebrate a year. No, six months. We're still pretty er pretty early okay. on. Okay, it. six months, six months. Sorry about that. Um, so six months. Um, he's been running Ecom Balance. And honestly, I it, it, it's super exciting to see what they're building. Um, so I'll, I'll let him kind of share the goodies, what he, exactly he's doing, but he's here to share some of the best practices of bookkeeping with us that agency owners should know. Um, and, and I think he's got a lot of different meeting structures that he can share with us. Also, um, he has a business partner, so he's very used to, uh, not just collecting information, but discussing this kind of information with a partner. So Nathan, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it away, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I'll, I'll kind of start this off by saying like, I'm not a bookkeeper. I'm good at hiring bookkeepers and building processes, but we won't be doing any technical bookkeeping today. Um, it's all high level. What an entrepreneur should be doing, what your monthly process should look like, what systems you should have in place. And um, so that's part of it. And then like you mentioned the, the private equity, I mean, what really happened was we sold our, our company free up and one of the main reasons we sold it is we made really good decisions every month based on what the numbers were telling us. And we had a good bookkeeping process, um, but we also passed due diligence when we went to sell it and had immaculate books um, going back to, to day one. And so when we sold free up, we started doing some consulting. That's what Michael was kind of referring to in the private equity. And we learned very quickly that we didn't like consulting or being consultants. But the common theme with all these different agencies and e-commerce businesses that, that we would work with was before we could really do any consulting, we would sit down and revamp all their books and segment it out and make sure that we actually knew what the numbers were saying because it was impossible to give advice or suggestions um, without real clear numbers. And that kind of gave us the idea to, to start a bookkeeping service. Uh, we named it Ecom Balance because we're pretty well known in the e-commerce space. We're actually launching a second brand uh, called Accounts Balance that's going to be for agencies. And we already get referrals and stuff for, for non-e-commerce businesses. Um, E-commerce tends to be the, the most complicated uh, bookkeeping. So if you can do e-com, everything else is, is pretty simple. But that's kind of where we are now. It's been a, a fun six months. We've built a team of 10 people in Colorado, uh, in the Philippines. We've got about 60 clients, um, a lot of process, a lot of training. Our, our goal is to really create the, the entrepreneur bookkeeping experience because from a lot of our market research, a lot of these bookkeepers aren't good at hiring, aren't good at scaling, aren't good at customer communication, aren't good at putting things in a way that an entrepreneur can understand and they only speak bookkeepers. So we're kind of trying to take a, a different approach there and, and our core service is monthly bookkeeping, which we can talk about. But I, I kind of want to start it off with the, the mentality that, that I kind of learned as an entrepreneur is that there's no situation that an entrepreneur should do their own bookkeeping. First of all, it's just not a good use of your time. You have a limited amount of time um, in, in life. And any time you spend on sales, marketing, expansion, decision-making, growing your business, hiring, those are the things that you should be spending time on. And second of all, nine out of 10 times that entrepreneurs do their books, and I know I fell into this category back when I was 20 doing my own books for, for my Amazon business, it, you just have to pay to get it redone later by someone who actually knows what they're doing. And I can't tell you how many cleanup projects we get where someone has been doing their own books for the past year and we get in there and we have to revamp everything. And it would have been way cheaper if they just hired someone to do it from day one. And even if you're, you were a bookkeeper or a CPA in a previous life and you know bookkeeping and you'll do it right, I would still argue that it's not a great use of your time. So that's kind of a, that's kind of my foundational standpoint. Any questions there before I keep going? 
cool. So I, I got one. I got yeah. one. Is there is let, let's say that there's, you know, a small we just started out. Right. Um, should it be day one that we have a bookkeeper or, OK, hey, we need to build it up a little bit, get five, ten thousand dollars a month. OK, now I should have a bookkeeper or, or what do you think is the appropriate decision as an entrepreneur? So one of the best decisions I made with free up is when we were still in the idea stage, we, we maybe had a client or two. We definitely weren't profitable. We, we had expenses was we hired a bookkeeper from day one and every single month we would still get those reports. like I'm about to talk about and they showed losses, but we at least had the reports and we knew where the money was going and what was happening and we could make decisions based off of them. And I mean, maybe you can't afford us. I mean, we're pretty cheap. We're 250 a month is our minimum. And we have clients who pay 2k a month, but maybe you're starting off and you can't afford 250 a month and you hire a cheaper bookkeeper. That's fine too, but you shouldn't be hiring someone to train them to be a bookkeeper. That's crazy. I was talking to someone today who wanted to hire a VA that had never done bookkeeping and teach them bookkeeping. That's a huge waste of your time, especially if you don't know bookkeeping and doing them to yourself is not a good use of your time. You have to remember that most small businesses fail. So if you're starting off and your time is pulled away from what you're actually doing, and you're also making decisions based on reports that maybe aren't accurate or might not even be getting done because they're getting pushed back, that's not a great way to, to get a business off the ground. So you can find cheaper bookkeeping services than mine, I'm sure. Um, but you should have someone doing your books and, and you can always upgrade later. And if you're serious about being an entrepreneur, it's something that should be hired from day one. Um, it's also one of the more like one of the cheaper things. Like if you're a new company, usually your bookkeeping is not that expensive per month and your business isn't going to succeed or fail because of the 250 that you're spending a month on bookkeeping. If anything, it's going to help you um, and eventually hurt you if you don't do it. Makes that a lot your sense. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I like to think of accounting as three parts. So you've got your, your CPA, your tax person. Uh, we don't do taxes. We might add that later. And if anyone wants a referral to, to my CPA that I've worked with for 10 years, I'm happy to um, happy to share it. He's great. He helped me sell a company for forever in debt uh, to him. But you need, a, you need a tax person, a CPA that knows your industry. If you're uh, running an agency, you should have a CPA that has other agencies as clients. And they're the people who set up your estimated taxes. You can do tax planning, who file your tax at the end of the year. Um, and that's one piece of it. And there's a lot of benefit to having them as a solo just focused on tax. A lot of times when you find CPA companies that um, also do bookkeeping, they do bookkeeping in a way for them to file taxes, which doesn't mean it's wrong. The numbers are right, but it, they're not doing it in a way to give you information to make decisions on your business. They're just lumping expenses together to pay the right amount of taxes because that's what they're good at. They're also not the best at getting in a good monthly process, which we'll talk about because they have busy seasons. They have tax season in April. They have extension date in October, which is coming up. So for them to stay on a good monthly bookkeeping rhythm, they, they need to be, they need to have a really good systems down. And some do, but most don't. There's also a lot of benefit to just having two minds working together uh, as a, as a, almost like a team helping your business, because th there's a lot of, parts of bookkeeping that are very black and white. This is gap generally accepted accounting principles. There's other stuff that's a little bit gray, not that you should push the line or do anything illegal, but there could be different ideas that are thrown around that can help your business that, that help you understand information that save you money on taxes that if your bookkeeper does a certain thing. So you want that kind of collaborative effort. And a lot of times you'll lose it if it's all in one company. So those are two things you just need. There's no way around it. You need a tax person. You need a bookkeeper, like I already talked about, um, that you should have. And, and the third piece is that CFO. So um, you can have a, a full-time CFO, obviously, if you're, if you're a large company. There are plenty of part-time and outsourced CFOs. Usually those come into play once you get over like that $5 million a year mark. Usually if you're below that, you don't necessarily need it. Although there's some part-time CFO services that um, might add so, some benefit, but that's kind of like that perfect trifecta that you should be working towards is having a CFO, an accountant and a bookkeeper separated, focused on what they're good at. It also saves you money because CPAs are more expensive than bookkeepers and CFOs are usually more expensive than both accounts and bookkeepers. So by keeping them in their lane, you're, you're kind of keeping everyone where they're good at and what their, their price point is. Um, any questions there before I keep going? Cool. So what are you yes. kind of... Yes, I have, I have, yeah, sorry, I have a question. Um, difference between CPA and CFO, I've heard the acronym before, but I don't have a CFO for my company just yet. So. 
How, how little, big do you say your company was? Sorry, you're kind question. of cutting in and out. Um, well, we, we, we're, we're a startup. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about a CFO. To be honest, I've never hired a CFO in any of my companies. Um, I ran like free up. We got to doing $12 million a year. The next step probably was hiring a CFO if I didn't sell it and we wanted to grow to 25 mil or 50 mil. But like I, I, a lot of people overplay the CFO and you like to me, you should get good at making good decisions based on what your numbers are telling you before someone else gives you advice on how to spend your money and projections and stuff like that. It's when you get to that point where you've made really good decisions and you you prove that you make good decisions, that you understand the numbers of your business, but your business has gotten massive and the decisions that you make like count a hundred times and that they previously did, previously did. And that's where you bring in someone who has worked in those bigger businesses to, to be another, um, or, or I guess another like voice to, to kind of help you there, if that makes sense. But it's usually not necessary in the, the startup phase. So what is the distinction between the CPA and the CFO? So CPA is actually filing your taxes and giving you tax advice. And like I pay estimated taxes every quarter. They're the people who plan that out. The CFO is helping a lot with forecasting and predictions and uh, big business decisions, going through your numbers, digging deeper into the numbers, helping to figure out what KPIs are important for your business, stuff like that. They're not actually filing taxes and they shouldn't be doing your books. If you're paying them to do your books, you're, you're drastically overpaying usually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So what do, what do the entrepreneurs need to know? So the the tech stack for, for bookkeeping. So there, there's two main companies that, that I recommend. One is QuickBooks, which I'm sure you've heard of, and the other is Xero that's actually located in Denver. That's kind of a, a much bigger player. There's other free accounting software like Wave, um, GoDaddy Books, which I think they're ending. Those are free for a reason. Don't waste your time doing them. You're just gonna have to move them over to QuickBooks or Xero um, at some point down the line. Yeah, QuickBooks Online, it costs a monthly fee. It's like 40, 50 bucks a month. Just pay it. There's no way around it. Like don't use QuickBooks Desktop. We live in 2022. Everything's remote. Unless you have a someone actually coming into your office to do your books, which I'm assuming you guys don't. Um, QuickBooks Online or Xero, which is always online, um, it is the way to go. And just getting it in those softwares from the beginning is, is, the, is by far the best decision you can make. Everyone kind of has their own preference between Zero and QuickBooks. What I like to focus on is like, what is your bookkeeper more comfortable in? Like we use Zero at FreeUp. Um, we, the team that we hired, our controller is more comfortable in QuickBooks Online. They're both pretty interchangeable. Each one has its own like small pluses and minuses, um, but you want to use whatever your bookkeeper is comfortable with. And it's a gigantic pain to move data over from one to the other or from a different bookkeeping software into it. And if you use companies like Bench, um, which is definitely one of the cheaper options, although it, it adds a lot of manual work on your side, the bigger down side is they, they have their own accounting software. So if you want to move to a different bookkeeper in the future, if you're not happy with them or whatever, you're kind of stuck on their software and whatever, whoever your new bookkeeper is, is going to have to do a lot of work to get everything uh, into QuickBooks and Xero. Uh, you also want to own your own books. You don't want a situation where the bookkeeper is the admin of your books. That's just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I was talking to a client today whose bookkeeper just disappeared off the face of the earth. And like, if that person has ownership of your books, that can be a huge disaster. So even if you work with a bookkeeping company, you should be the owner of QuickBooks and you should be giving them account and access. And then you can remove that access. If you fire them, you can give someone else access, but always make sure you, you own your bookkeeper. Any questions on kind of the tech stack? There's some other stuff like A2X that's more e-commerce related, but um, I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't think you guys are e-commerce sellers. Would you, I have another question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you recommend using QuickBooks for keepers or? So keep in mind like that, they're kind of my competition, right? So you can take whatever I say with a grain of salt, but like, to me, it's like, do you want to work with a massive company of a lot of people that you're probably never going to get to know? There's going to be people moving around the company all the time. They're probably not getting to know your business because they, they're just a gigantic company. Like Inuit's a publicly traded company with thousands and thousands of employees. So it's just like, Hey, if, if you're going for cheapest possible price, potentially that's a good option. If you're going for the best service for your business, then maybe it's not a good option. Um, we've had clients that have gone with Bench. We've had clients that have gone to QuickBooks that kind of like turned down our quote because they saved 50 bucks or a hundred bucks and they came back a month later and, and moved to us. So it just depends on, on what your preference is and, and what you're looking for.
Thank you. Cool. Um, so when, in terms of the other stuff that you should be aware of when it comes to, to tech stack, so you want to make it easy on your bookkeeper by using banks and credit cards and processors that allow view only access. And it not only makes it easier on bookkeepers, it makes it easier on you because we're going to talk about a good monthly process and the less work you have to do, the better. Like the worst thing is if you have to download statements every month and email them every month to your bookkeeper. And sure, it's not the biggest deal. You have to log into your account and download statements, but it's just one extra thing you have to do every single month. Certain months you'll get busy. You don't want to delay the bookkeeper. So you want to use banks that al allow view only access. You can log right in your bank. You can see if they allow view only access. You can Google it. And you don't want to use personal accounts for um, business. Even first of all, you should never intermingle um, personal and business. That's just a huge liability because, like, even having an LLC, if you're mixing personal and business, they can come after you because um, it's um, breaking the corporate veil. But it's also just a pain for bookkeeping. It's also against a lot of IRS codes in terms of paying taxes. So you definitely want to separate it. But a lot of people will make the mistake where they'll have a personal account that's just for business. And while there's nothing legally wrong with it and you can completely run your business that way, you can't give personal like view only access with personal accounts. I have yet to see a bank or a credit card that allows that. So you want to open up a business account. There's plenty of free ones. It usually doesn't cost anything. I've never had a credit card fee, a credit card that has had a monthly fee in my life. There's plenty of free ones out there. But make sure it's a business account so that you can give you only access and make sure that the account um, allows you only access. Same thing if you're using like Stripe and PayPal allow easy view only access. If you're using one of the smaller processors, they might not. So that's something to kind of keep in mind if you really want to get a good monthly process down is what banks you use, what processor you use. Um, and I mean, generally, like the simpler is the better. The, the less accounts you have, the better. A lot of people like profit first. I think I have that book somewhere behind me. Um, <laughs> I, I've never done profit first. I think it's a little insane to have like six bank accounts and just be moving money around all the time. I don't see how that makes it better. I think it's it's fine for people who are bad at like holding on money and paying taxes at the end of the year. That's never really been like a problem for me because you just pay estimated taxes or you just save up and pay taxes at the end of the year. Um, or people that are like bad at paying themselves, which again, I've just never had an issue with. Like if the business is making money, take money out of it every single month and figure out what that percentage is. So that's my personal preference. I'm sure there's plenty of people that are smarter than me that disagree with it. But the the, the bigger point is like the less bank accounts, the less credit cards, having view only access, making sure they're all business and you're not using personal accounts. Um, that's what's going to make a, a smooth monthly process and make it easier for your bookkeeper and usually make it cheaper for you too. Because if we're pricing a client and they have two bank accounts that are very easy to use, or they have 10 bank accounts that are all a pain that we have to get manual statements, we're obviously going to charge that person with 10 bank accounts more because it's more work on our end. Any questions? Sir? Nathan, yes, Nathan, I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, in, in reference to, um, I have Chase and I'm connecting Panda Docs with, with Stripe. Those are fairly simple. And, and what are you saying? Uh, make sure that it's allow view, uh, viewing only so that you don't have to download the statements. I'm, I'm not understanding. Yeah, this is for the bookkeepers and your accountant if needed, but you're mostly your bookkeepers to be able to download the statements without contacting you. Like for, for all of our clients, let's say that we give someone a quote and they agree to it, they want to work with us. The next step is integration before we have a kickoff call where we get view only access to all their accounts. Um, we, we don't want full access. We won't allow you to give us full access. If you give us full access to your bank account, we're going to remove it because that's just too much liability. We don't want it to the ability to move your money around. We only want the statements that we need Need to do the bookkeeping. So that, that's what I'm talking about. Chase and Stripe um, are, are actually good banks. They both allow you only access, no problem. Um, they're Stripe's a processor. But um, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Cool. So so let's kind of talk about the, the monthly process. Now you kind of have my mentality on bookkeeping and who should be doing it and what your setup should be. Um, we talked about like what technology you should be using and it's kind of part of every business. Anytime you open a new business, you need a QuickBooks account, you need a zero account, you need a bookkeeper, you need an account. And um, those are kind of the basics. So the, the way that bookkeeping should work is it should be on a monthly basis. Now, what I used to do was delay bookkeeping as long as possible 
dump it all on my accountant at the end of the year and have him put it all together to file my taxes. And he would have from January until March to do my taxes. He would have enough time to do it, but that doesn't allow you to make decisions every single month. There are other people that want to do bookkeeping quarterly. Again, the whole purpose of bookkeeping is to be able to make good decisions every single month. Sure, it helps you get in potential funding or investments or sell a business, but most businesses don't go through an exit. Most businesses don't get funding. So the real thing is making good decisions every single month. And if you're only getting data every single quarter, that's not a, enough frequency to make decisions. Now, you can have certain KPIs and certain metrics and, and sales that you look at more than once a month. That's totally fine. Once a week, bi-weekly, whatever it is, daily. Um, but that monthly is going to tell you how that month went. And the goal is to compare this month to last month and this month to the same month last year or previous years. And that's what you should be doing every single month. So the month should end by the 10th to the 15th, every single month, like clockwork, with no delays, no, no excuses, you should get an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow. And you should have a meeting on your calendar um, that where you go through all three documents with your business partner, your husband, your wife, your team leaders, whoever it is. And you're going through these documents and that's where you're making your business decisions every single month based on what the numbers are actually telling you. Um, if you go to econbalance.com, you can actually grab our, our monthly agenda. And we've been doing this for six plus years. Every month on the 16th, like clockwork, there's a meeting in our calendar. We go through a give statement, we go through balance sheet, um, we go through cash flow um, every single time. And, and that's where like the biggest decisions are, are made. That's where you're going to see, hey, we're, we're selling more of the X service versus uh, Y service. This is where you're going to see, hey, our, our payroll is going up faster than our sales. And you're going to be able to, to make those decisions. So month ends by the 15th, you're getting those reports. And then you have a meeting like clockwork that doesn't get missed every single month where you're going through those. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Excuse the, the noise in the background. I'm obviously uh, multitasking here. Um, yeah. What was that website again? Uh, Econbalance.com. my shirt. <laughs> and what were the three documents we should be reviewing? Monthly Inca income. Statement. Income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. All right. Thank you. Now, there's there's what there, there's really three things that you need to be able to do financially as an entrepreneur. And none of them involve actually going into QuickBooks and doing the bookkeeping or doing reconciliation or anything along those lines. What you have to be able to do is read an income statement, read a balance sheet, and read cash flow. It's a, it's a great life skill. It's a great entrepreneur skill. Um, it's something that not only helps you in your own business, it helps you invest in business. If any of you are like buy stocks or, or um, even whether short term or long term, um, like you have to know how to read these statements. There, there's no way around it. And that doesn't mean you have to be a master of it on day one. You just have to get better at it over time. And there, there's two ways to, to get better at them. You read books and there's a lot of finance books behind me and, and you do like the whole podcast and learning or you look at your own business reports every single month and every single month you're going to get better at understanding what's going on in your business than you did the previous month. And if something comes up that you don't understand, you're going to ask questions to your CPA, you're going to ask questions to your bookkeeper um, and you're going to, to slowly learn how to get better at it. But that should be every single month you're going through income statement balance sheet, cash flow, and you're getting better and better at understanding those financial statements. Um, there's very few successful entrepreneurs that are bad at reading those statements. Um, I say I, I like growing unsexy businesses like hiring and, and bookkeeping. And it's very similar. Like if you're bad at hiring, you're going to really struggle to grow your business. If you're bad at reading financial reports, um, you're going to really struggle to, to make the right decisions on your business. Any questions there before I keep going? Sure. Uh, so since you talk about this so much, uh, do you actually have any kind of resources where you actually take people through a cash, you know, their, their cash flow, their balance sheet, their income statement? Do you have any of that? So I don't, I find that very boring content, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Most people don't want me to come on their podcast and go through income statements and cash flow. <laughs> um, but the, we, there's plenty of stuff on the Econ Balance blog, if you go there, that breaks it all down. Um, and obviously, if you're like a client of ours, we're going to go through it with you. We're going to make sure you understand it. Um, I. I've been holding off creating like a presentation about it. Um, yeah, it might happen at, at some point, but we have plenty of content on it on the Econ Balance blog. They're also the most popular three income statements. So if you just sure. Google 
how do I read an income statement? How do I read a balance sheet? How do I read cash flow? There's a billion articles out there where you'll learn how to do it very, very quickly. Cool. Any questions? Um, all right. So two things you need to know for, for like how you're doing your bookkeeping. And that's if you, if you're doing cash basis or accrual basis. So a lot of times your CPA will be the one to give you advice there. Um, and, and a lot of it depends how you're receiving money. So like free up, for example, the, the business model was we would freelancers would build clients. We charge the clients and then pay the freelancer the following week. So there's a buffer period, but all money was getting received like within the same month, most of the time. Um, and we didn't really have like net thir net 90 terms with vendors and we weren't chasing clients for money because it was automatic billing. So doing a cash basis was, made a lot of sense. There was really no reason to do accrual. So cash basis is when anything that you spend, anything you charge on your credit card or you send money out or money appears in your bank account, it gets recorded at like the moment that it's actually paid, that you actually get the money or you actually send the money. Um, and that makes it very clean and is easy for a lot of agencies. But accrual is when you actually enter into the agreement. So if you, if, if I, I'll give an inventory example, then I'll give a non-inventory example. If you're an e-commerce seller and you buy $50,000 worth of inventory, you don't want to be on cash basis because that's going to show a large purchase in January. That's going to make your January numbers not look very good, potentially at a loss. And then February, March, and April might look really good because you don't have the $50,000 worth of inventory. Um, but that doesn't really tell you anything. Like what it really needs to be is accrual where you spread that inventory out over time. Um, where it comes into play... <coughs> more for agencies is if you have those net 90 terms. If you're not paying your, your team quickly or you're not paying your vendors, maybe you're white labeling it um, or you're, you're not collecting payments from your clients because you want to actually see how much money, like how profitable your business is, which is different from your cash flow. So if you're, if you're a negative cash flow because people aren't paying you, that's going to show up on your cash flow statement. But if you made a lot of sales and you're, you just haven't gotten paid yet, it's still going to show that you're profitable um, in, if you're using accrual, accrual bookkeeping, which is incredibly useful to know because you want to make sure that your company is actually making money. You also want to make sure that it flows cash flow. Um, if, you, if you're just doing cash basis, they're, they're very, they end up being very, very similar. Does that make sense? Um, it's also something where usually most businesses start off cash it's a little bit cheaper to do the bookkeeping um, and you can always change it to accrual down the line. And usually you want to do it at like a clean cutoff point. Like you'll do it going into a new year. Like your business has grown, you wait till January 1st and then you move over to accrual um, and it's not that, that big of a deal. Um, it's actually a box that your CPA is going to check whether you're, you did it in cash or accrual. Um, you can't like go back and forth a lot because that's like tax manipulation, but um, you can usually like change within a reason. What do you mean by accrual again? So accrual is the money shows up on your income statement when you actually enter into the agreement. So if if you if you sell, I'm just gonna let's say a PPC package to to someone, um, and you agree to it in July, and it's ten thousand dollars. That ten thousand dollars is gonna show up. Um, in July on your income statement. But if they don't pay you until September, um, then it's already been accounted for in July. You're not going to count in September. In September, when you actually get the cash, it's going to appear on your cash flow statement. Um, but that that's going to help you understand like what you're actually making, not what people pay you. Because let's say you enter into all these agreements in July, but all of them pay you in September. Like it, how, seeing a report that shows you made nothing in July, like that doesn't really help you. You want to be able to see your sales in July and also see like what cash is coming in. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of wrapping it up. I mean, that's kind of the way that I approach bookkeeping and what you need to know. You, you should focus on having a good monthly process where you're getting those reports every single month. You're reviewing them with your team. You're getting to better understand income statement balance and ca balance sheet and cash flow. And you need to understand the numbers of your business. I mean, for, for any of you guys that are looking to sell your company in the future, one of the, the big things that, that you do is you earn trust with the person potentially buying your company. And I remember the initial call we had uh, with the people buying free up and they asked a lot of financial questions and 
we didn't really have anything in front of us. We were at a conference and we answered those questions. We, we knew our profit margins. We knew our sales totals. We knew um, how, what percentage of clients make up total revenue. And, and then when the, we actually got into due diligence, everything that we told them on the phone matched exactly what was in our books. And that's a, a huge trust factor. I can't tell you how many people go to buy a company and they have this great initial phone call and then they dive into the books and they're, they're like, wait a second, this doesn't match anything that, that we talked about. Um, or even worse, the books aren't caught up and then you have to wait 60 days or whatever uh, for a bookkeeper to catch everything up because a bookkeeper is not going to be able to catch up a year's worth of books in, in a week for you. Um, it takes time to, to kind of do it right. Um, and there, there could be a good amount of data or transactions depending on, on your business. So you want to have everything set up from day one. It's going to open up a lot of opportunities for you. But more importantly, it's going to help you make good decisions every single month based on what the numbers are telling you. Um, one quick point I forgot is just how you segment the books is important. And you don't have to do this on day one, but every single month you can make tweaks and adjustments to how your books are segmented. A good example of this is for free up, we had uh, fixed price and hourly freelancers. So we at the top, it would show total revenue, but it would also break it down by fixed price and hourly. So we knew which one was doing better and we could see the trends for each one. So if you're offering different services, um, you can segment your books in a different way to give you the information that you need. And that's super useful for the actual decision making. Cool, happy to kind of answer any questions. That, that's my uh, presentation for the high level overview of what entrepreneurs should have set up in their business for bookkeeping. Yeah, I actually have a question for you, Nathan. Hi, I'm Dominique. Um, <laughs> Hey, uh, quick question about personal. I, I guess it's like a, I guess it's a personal decision, but what are your thoughts on using QuickBooks to, um, for your own personal bookkeeping? Um, I, some people feel like it's overkill. Some people feel like it's not, it's the best decision. What are your thoughts there? No, I mean, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, the, the, no one should ever tell you like, like personal budgeting or personal finances isn't worth it. It's definitely worth it. It just depends on um, like how, like what way you want to go about it. Like me personally, I would never use QuickBooks in my personal books because I'm not a bookkeeper. I don't really like using QuickBooks. I leave that to the professionals. And in every company I hire, um, I, I hire really good people to do it, but I do do my own budgeting. I, I do my own like asset versus liabilities calculations. Um, and I have my own method of doing it. So you definitely should be doing that for your own personal finances. If you're listening and you're not doing that, um, whether you want to use QuickBooks or your own tools, or there's another company, Mint, um, th there's a bunch of them out there. That's more of a personal preference. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Are we all done? I did have another question, but it's not completely bookkeeping related. Um, it's more like payroll related. Is that okay if I ask or that we're going off topic? Yes, here? you can do it. If I can't answer it, I'm just going to be honest with you. But Okay, cool. <laughs> That's what I like. Um, so with, I was, I had this idea to, in, you know, instead of just having our savings for taxes to also use it for payroll as well. What are your thoughts on that? Is it best to keep, keep them separate because they really kind of. Wait, sorry, I didn't understand the question. You had, you had the idea to do what? Use our savings account, like instead of just using it just for saving for taxes, to also use it for like payroll as your, well. Your business savings account or your personal yes. savings account? Business. And you, you wanted to use it to like just debit it to do payroll? Yeah. So not doing like active transactions. Of course, that's what the checking is for but just using it for saving for taxes and payroll. What are you? Yeah. Thoughts? And you payroll, you're using like Gusto or something. Gusto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Gusto is great. Yeah. I mean, there's, it doesn't matter if you can like debit them. So there used to be all these rules of how many times you could like take money out of your <laughs> savings. Yeah. Um, I don't think those exist anymore. I think something passed where the banks can't do that. You should definitely check that. So you don't get yeah. charged like bank fees or whatever. Um, yeah. But there's nothing like wrong with it from a bookkeeping side. Like if you, if we're your bookkeepers, we're going to have you only access to your checkings, your savings, and any money that goes out of either is going to go into your books. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Yeah. And if that helps you like do more of the profit first thing where you're saving for taxes, by all means mm -hmm. do it. And it's probably way better than having six bank accounts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I like consolidation, you know? <laughs> and I'm just like, well, it's not, you know, your payroll is like, 
but every other week and then your taxes is like quarterly or a year and depending on how you do it so i'm like either way i don't see how that oversteps the savings account boundaries you know so i'm like what's the point of having all of these different stuff if i i just like to be organized i, I haven't really dipped fully fully into proper first even though i do like it but i i'm just a fan of consolidation at the end of the day yeah it's similar to like if your company has two credit cards instead of just like randomly using each credit card whenever like you pull one out of your pocket like have some system where like ad charges go on only one card and right. everything else goes on the other like come up with something to, to make it easy it can only help you yeah for sure okay i just wanted to ask i'll be asking i'll be asking my my, fin my financial team anyway but i'm just curious what your thoughts were <laughs> yeah no good question all right i think that's it cool well, well if oh i have a question quick question yeah. oh nathan um what book would you recommend to learn more about this topic in terms of like like a practical book to learn more um learn more on, on structuring that like your business and stuff like that that you have read yeah attraction's a good one um i don't implement like eo the way that a lot of people do but i take bits and pieces of it and implement and put it into my company and it it kind of has the right idea to have the right people in the right seats so so that's a okay. good one um you say attraction uh just traction oh yeah, traction. traction okay uh if you're going more on like excuse me, how do I learn income statement balance sheet cash flow? I would like grab stock books, like Warren Buffett books. Um, Cause like, that's what people that buy stocks strategically do. They're looking at those three statements and everything that's in those for a multi-billion dollar corporation is the same thing that you're looking at with your books, just on a smaller scale. So that's kind of where I would turn to, to kind of understand that from a small business. I would avoid any books that are like, this is how you do bookkeeping. This is how you do QuickBooks or like buying a, how do I do QuickBooks course? Like that's not a good use of your time. Focus on the, the high level stuff. Gotcha. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Ken? Uh, yeah, I just had a comment on the structure of how you might use for Dominique uh, payroll accounts versus savings accounts and how you group money. Um, it doesn't have to, any, in bookkeeping, it doesn't matter um, because you can see it anywhere. But I will tell you from a risk exposure standpoint, a lesson we've learned, and Tina happens to be here, happens to be our CFO, um, from a re risk, risk exposure standpoint, any we like to group accounts uh, and, and structure accounts now based on whether or not they're ex externally exposed. And what I mean by that is, do you write checks out of them? Because there are a lot of uh, scams now going on where people will take your checks, print your checks and process your checks. And the only way out of that when they start falsely printing your checks is to close the account. So if you're using a payroll account that you actually, uh, maybe you're doing direct deposit for some employees, but one employee actually is still getting checks, that's an exposure. If you're using an account to pay checks to a vendor, because the only way you can pay them is through, through checks because maybe they don't take ACH or what have you. The other side of that is if you are going to be using a debit card for something, realize that you only have a limited amount of protection in a debit card convert and compared to a credit card where they can come in on a debit card uh, and hit the account really hard. Um, trust me when I say that you, when you get involved and deal with one of those, you want you don't want to have to scramble around suddenly and uh, have your savings exposed, if you will, uh, or necessarily, you know, the, the, the time it takes to process and, and pull that back. So any accounts that have external touches to them, uh, those are ones I would say keep them limited. Uh, maybe not have the 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 depth of balance, make deposits into them as you need to make deposits, so that those external transactions can occur, but not necessarily have external reaches into your. Uh, and the one thing that I heard was savings. So I don't necessarily want external reaches into my savings account. That's just something I want to share. Yeah, those are all good thoughts and points. Yeah, that was really helpful. Yeah, there won't be really much I'm trying to think. Yeah, just between paying payroll, there's no checks. Yeah, we usually don't do much with checks anymore, but it's that's really good to know. Um, I didn't know 
that fraud situation. So thank you for sharing that. Um, now I definitely won't be doing checks, but, uh, <laughs> but, but even still, um, that uh, you actually answered one of my questions that I was going to ask my bank. Um, no, well, not really ask them, but I was just making the decision if I was going to attach like a, uh, like a card to that account or not. And now I'm definitely not going to do it because I don't, I really don't need to for the, for both of those purposes, I, I'm not going to need it. So, so I mean, understand. you don't have a card, but you get what I mean. Let me add one, let me add one uh, caveat to that. It, it is not necessarily just checks. Any situation in which you're going to actually expose the checking account number, meaning mm. if I'm going to make a payment or, or receive ACH payments, I'm going to have to, re, uh, to expose that checking account number, believe it or not that number can be turned into a check and that right. and then that and so that all you have to have is that checking account number and the only way if somebody starts scamming with that checking account number to mm -hmm. stop it is to shut the account down Got that's it. the only way out okay. um and it really sucks to be in that situation ask tina okay i got you so separate it <laughs> people <laughs> been there done that not, 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 a, not a fun place to be an absolute you're trying to run your business <laughs> with the hassle so gotcha thank you Ken. i appreciate that thanks yeah thanks absolutely guys. external exposure just think about it from that that angle that lens of what account is exposed externally gotcha done thank you so much all right well, hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Um, guys, I could not recommend a bookkeeping company more than Nathan's. I just know that he just takes very good care of his customers. Um, no matter what business he is, he's in, I just highly trust Nathan. Couldn't give him a higher recommendation. So if you're looking for a bookkeeping company, definitely check out Ecom Balance. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I appreciate it. If you guys are interested in using us two months free or on me um, to try us out. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me on. So see you guys and have a good rest of the day. Have a good Nathan, one. Thanks a lot. You said something about accounts balance. Hi, everybody. Is yeah, so true? right now, just use Econ Balance. We're launching Accounts Balance. So I think it's coming out next week. So um, it's the same thing. We have a team that just does non-e-commerce businesses, um, but we'll take care of you either way if you just go to Econ Balance. Cool. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye, y'all. Thank you, Thanks, guys. That was fun. Yeah.